Okay guys, this is a particularly tough area of pharmacology because knowing these lipid lowering agents function requires remembering and understanding some physiology behind lipid metabolism. This is a super high yield subject because an unreal amount of patients are on some sort of lipid lowering agent, particularly HMG CoA reductase inhibitors. And side effects are common with these drugs. So first of all, what is cholesterol? It is a sterol derivative synthesized by a bunch of steps that no one needs to know and no one ever knows, but you need to know the rate limiting enzyme, which is a common theme for your step one exam. The rate limiting step or enzyme for cholesterol synthesis is HMG-CoA. So let's talk a little bit more about why cholesterol is important in the physiology of LDL. LDL stands for low density lipoprotein because it is incredibly full of triglycerides and cholesterol with a very small percentage of protein. So that makes it is very low density because fats are not very dense. They float to the top of emulsions, particularly mixing water and olive oil. You can note that the olive oil will float to the top. LDL is able to deliver cholesterol to the wall of the vasculature, which is a big problem for us, and that is our main focus. So if you block this rate limiting step by inhibiting HMG-CoA, you prevent the formation of the main structural component of LDL, which is cholesterol. Therefore, you decrease the amount of LDL that can be made by the liver. So how does the liver do with this decrease in LDL synthesis capacity? Well, it's going to compensate by producing more HDL. And why does it do that? Because HDL is responsible for reverse cholesterol transport. HDL takes cholesterol out of the peripheral tissue, such as within the vasculature, and it takes fats also back to the liver so that the hepatocytes can make more LDL. The hepatocytes upregulate LDL receptors in response to being unable to synthesize cholesterol because the statin is inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase. Now, the side effects are highly tested, the concept that you must know. So first of all, we're already in hepatocyte. So what actually metabolizes these HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors? Well, same thing. Hepatocyte CYP enzymes metabolize statins. So it makes sense that metabolism of this drug can cause damage to hepatocytes that are already straining, trying to compensate for the lack of their ability to synthesize cholesterol because we're blocking a very important enzyme for them, HMG-CoA reductase. Rhabdomyolysis, meaning lysis of muscle tissue, is another high yield side effect because statins inhibit coenzyme Q in myocytes. You remember how coenzyme Q10 is an electron carrier from complex 1 and 2 to 3 in the electron transport chain. And the final electron transporter is cytochrome C oxidase. So if we decrease coenzyme Q10 because our statins inhibit its synthesis, we directly interrupt the cell from performing aerobic respiration because we're disturbing the normal flow of the electron transport chain. Therefore, these myocytes switch to anaerobic metabolism, which is a perfect setup for stressing your muscles and causing accumulation of lactate, and then the muscle will start to break itself down so it can utilize amino acids, and therefore you get a humongous risk for rhabdomyolysis. This is why some physicians advocate taking supplements of coenzyme Q10 if their patients are having muscle pain or myalgias on statins. Okay, so now let's focus on how we can take in exogenous cholesterol. You eat animal fats, which contain cholesterol, and triglycerides. Bile salts emulsify this. And then lipase breaks them down into fatty acids plus monoglycerol. This is something very high yield from your GI section. Here is the first time that we can intervene with therapy. Bile helps the absorption of cholesterol, cholesterol esters, fatty acids, and fat-soluble vitamins. 
bile salts are an important component of bile that are made from cholesterol. So by giving someone a bile acid binding resin, you bind up all these bile salts they have in their bile. And if they're bound by something, they can't be reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. So the bile salts that are bound with whatever drug you decide to give them will be eliminated in the feces. Remember, bile salts are usually reabsorbed in the terminal ileum, but not if they have a huge bulky resin attached to it. The overall effect is to decrease the reuptake of these bile salts so that the liver must utilize cholesterol from other places to make more. So with the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, we just prevented the synthesis of cholesterol. And with a bile acid binding resin, we prevent bile acids from binding cholesterol and therefore deprive these hepatocytes of cholesterol via a different mechanism. This is how you decrease LDL because you're decreasing the availability of a large component of LDL, which is cholesterol. So this is adverse side effects on the screen. Well, you're making someone eat this insoluble resin. They actually have to put it in their mouth and eat it so that it can get to the gut and bind these bile salts. So first of all, it looks like chalk, so that's very unattractive. Not only does it look like chalk and taste bad, but it can pile up. If you just imagine if you're someone just eating Play-Doh, it can cause severe constipation. It's a thick compound. It's not going to move very well through the gut. It can also decrease the ability of your gut to absorb fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Because you need bile salts to be able to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. They are very hydrophobic, so you need something like a bile salt to be able to facilitate their absorption through the gut, mucosa. Now what about the side effect of cholesterol gallstones? Bile is composed of bile salts, sodium bicarb, cholesterol, bile pigments, which are bilirubin breakdown products, and water. So if you exponentially cause an increase in the synthesis of bile salts by the liver, because you're binding the bile salts in the gut with your bile acid binding resin, you're going to create all of these components. And cholesterol can crystallize with itself and cause a stone. When we store this in the gallbladder, you predispose yourself for the formation of cholesterol stones. So not only can you prevent the absorption of bile salts to, to decrease LDL, but you can directly prevent the absorption of cholesterol into the enterocytes by using another drug, ezetimibe. Ezetimibe blocks the cholesterol uptake receptor, which is found on the enterocytes. The toxicities associated with ezetimibe include diarrhea, because you block the absorption of cholesterol. Therefore, cholesterol accumulates in the gut and is a very osmotically active compound. It pulls water into the lumen of the gut, and you can have profound diarrhea. And you can also cause hepatitis because ezetimibe is metabolized primarily by hepatocytes. So the drug can accumulate with them within the hepatocytes and cause damage. You decrease LDL because you block the absorption of the main component of LDL, which is the cholesterol. Okay, let's go back to the metabolism diagram. The enterocytes combine in the gut, this is our enterocyte, triacylglycerol, cholesterol, phospholipids, and an important protein called apolipoprotein B48. And this makes your brand new chylomicrons. Chylomicrons enter the lymphatics and eventually enter the bloodstream. So right now we're sitting with a triglyceride and a cholesterol inside a molecule, a chylomicron, that has B48 apolipoprotein on its surface. In the blood, this newly formed chylomicron will gain two other apolipoproteins. It will gain C2 and E. This C2 apolipoprotein takes the chylomicron to lipoprotein lipase that is within capillaries. So it takes it to lipase, and what do you think lipase does? It hydrolyzes fats, or lipids. It will hydrolyze triglycerides into fatty acids. So it makes fatty acids from triglycerides. So we decrease the triglyceride component of this chylomicron. And the lipase takes the C2 apolipoprotein with it. 
we are left with a chylomicron remnant, which is cholesterol with a very small amount of triglyceride and B48 on the surface. What is important to see here is that the apolipoprotein E receptor that is also on the membrane will guide this chylomicron remnant to the hepatocytes, where it will bind LDL receptors to be taken up. Focus in here because this is when I will start discussing what the liver actually does. So the liver will make VLDL, as you can see here. It is producing VLDL molecules, which is very low density lipoprotein. It consists of a lot of triglyceride and a lot of cholesterol, hence it is very low density because there's not much protein, which is the dense component of these molecules. A VLDL has an apolipoprotein 100 on it. So just like the chylomicron, it will acquire apolipoprotein E and apolipoprotein C2. Remember that C2 will take the molecule to lipoprotein lipase within the capillary because it is present on endothelial cells and we will liberate the triglyceride in the form of fatty acids so that the tissues can accumulate fatty acids. So when that occurs, we are left with an intermediate density lipoprotein. We went from very low density to intermediate density because we got rid of some of the triglyceride that is not a dense molecule at all. Lipoprotein lipase took that and liberated fatty acids for our tissues to take up. So remember, lipoprotein lipase takes the C2 apolipoprotein with it. So the intermediate density lipoprotein is remaining with just the apolipoprotein 100 and E. So this is another place where we can intervene with the fibrates. The mechanism of action of fibrates will tell you the clinical results when you do a lipid cholesterol panel. So fibrates induce lipoprotein lipase. The particular fibrate on this one is gemfibrozil. It induces lipoprotein lipase in the peripheral tissues and binds and activates peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha. Again, that's peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha. And this causes increased lipolysis. So we increase lipolysis in two ways by inducing lipoprotein lipase and inducing peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha. PPAR alpha is just a fancy name for a transcription factor that induces the production of transporters and enzymes to increase hepatic fatty acid beta oxidation, which is why we get increased lipolysis overall. It also increases the synthesis of bile, which is how it can predispose you for one of the main side effects associated with STAT, which also predisposes you for the development of cholesterol gallstones. Another important mechanism of action is that the fibrates stimulate the production of apolipoprotein A1, which is the main apolipoprotein found on HDL. That means we will make more HDL, and more HDL means that we get more reverse cholesterol transport causing a decrease in our overall LDL because we decrease the amount of available cholesterol for the synthesis of LDL. Remember, HDL's function is to remove cholesterol from the peripheral tissue, and LDL's main job is to deliver cholesterol to the organs that need it heavily, such as the ovaries, testes, adrenal gland, and liver. So what about some of the side effects that board examiners want you to know because they absolutely love them? Well, muscles use a lot of fatty acids for energy, especially when you're exercising. So you increase the risk for myositis, especially if your patient is already on a statin. Well, we discussed how statins decrease what? They lower coenzyme Q10, which is why people get supplements with coenzyme Q10 when they're on a statin. You really need to watch out for hepatotoxicity with a lot of these drugs because many of them are metabolized by CYP enzymes that are found only in the hepatocytes. So therefore, they alter hepatic physiology. So we have one last lipid-lowering agent on the table. So let's go ahead and dominate this. It is our old friend from biochemistry, niacin, also known as B3. Remember, niacin is synthesized from tryptophan. So in a patient that has heart and up disease, which is a deficiency in a transporter in the proximal convoluted tubule that does not allow you to reuptake tryptophan,
you need tryptophan to synthesize niacin. Remember, without niacin, you are at risk for pellagra. Pellagra is defined as the three Ds. I like to consider the four Ds. The four Ds are diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis, and death. Niacin is very unique because it has its own unique receptor. The niacin receptor is associated with the GI inhibitory unit of the G protein complex. We know this decreases cyclic AMP and we know that beta adrenergic stimulation causes an increase in cyclic AMP, which means that we increase fat lipolysis. So niacin does the exact opposite and inhibits fat lipolysis to decrease the amount of triglycerides that are liberated from the lipolysis of fat. Liberated triglycerides are a huge component of LDL. So by decreasing triglycerides available for LDL synthesis within the hepatocyte, you get a decrease in the production of LDL. So by decreasing the availability of one of the components of LDL, it means you automatically decrease the production of LDL even though it is composed of more than just triglycerides. And niacin can also directly increase the production of HDL because it inhibits the reuptake of HDL by hepatocytes. So hepatocytes will respond by making more because there's no feedback mechanism telling the hepatocytes that the HDL that they made has now been reabsorbed.